In terms of covering today's topic, what we're going to dive into is a, a topic that's very difficult for most Christians to explain. Um, it's, it, you know, it's interesting, but we have the issue of the Trinity describing the characteristic of God. And, and in particular, we're going to be looking at how this is quite difficult for different people from different backgrounds to understand what is the Trinity that these Christians are talking about. And specifically, we know that um, there are different groups that we're looking at over the weeks. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at Japanese culture and people that come from a Shinto background. And again, we will go back to that at a later date. Today, we're going to go back to a, a, an ongoing topic, which is our dear brothers and sisters from Islamic background. <clears throat> we know that um, for, for Muslims, the topic of the Trinity is very difficult to, for them to understand. But why? And in terms of examining our cross-cultural uh, um, evangelism, it's very important that we, we can't just as Christians go up to people of other beliefs and just expect them to understand what we have given them. It really helps us to understand, well, why do they think the way they do? You know, many of them are very good people, lovely people. And we need to understand, you know, well, what's the hindrance to this objection? And so, you know, the, one of the Muslim objections we've been looking at is um, the fact of the Trinity. Many Muslims will tell you that there is only one God. And so, of course, they will say to you, how can Christians believe in the Trinity? How is it possible? You know, these are three gods, but Allah is only one. And of course, it's interesting, but for the Muslims, um, you know, the reason why they believe that is because what the Quranic teaching uh, gives them. You know, they know from Surah chapter 4, uh, verse 171 about this. And also in Surah 576 and also verse 76. And we're going to look at these to understand, well, well, why is it that a Muslim will disagree and not approve of the Trinity that the Christians uh, share from the Bible? You know, what, why? And so that's what we're going to look at today. You know, why is this such a, a challenging topic? And of course, what I really want to share with you, again, is, is look at these words, words, just to understand where they're coming from. You can see the actual Arabic um, narrative. And in Surah 4, 171, it says, O people of the book, do not exceed the bounds in your religion. And do not attribute anything to Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only an apostle of Allah. And his word that he cast towards Mary and a spirit from him. So have faith in Allah and his apostles. And do not say God is a trinity. Relinquish such a creed. That is better for you. Allah is but the one God. He is far too immaculate to have any son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth, and Allah suffices as trustee. So right here, you can see why um, you know, Muslims will believe, will struggle with the Trinity. So what can we say now? You see, my friends, who can give a description of the eternal God? You know, human minds are unable to fathom what is beyond our perception. And so for this reason, God introduced himself largely in metaphors uh, until he revealed himself on the human level in the body of Jesus Christ. God is so powerful, he could do that. And of course, Muslims consider the doctrine of the Trinity, as well as Jesus being the son of God, somewhat of a violation of the doctrine of the unity of God, which the Muslims will call the 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 Tahwid, the Tahwid, and you see Muhammad, for the Muslims, as far as can be concluded from the Quran, he he actually never knew the biblical writings through which one God reveals himself as being triune, um, you know, consisting of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, it sounds like three gods, but it's not. Christians would very much agree with Muslims that there is only one God. Absolutely. 
And so curiously, the Bible gives no explanation regarding God's Trinity. There is actually no explanation in the Bible about it. However, you know, there are some very useful Bible verses that we're going to look at together that I hope will help you understand, well, you know, why do we have the Trinity? Where does it come from? Where is the biblical accuracy to help us understand this? Um, and what we're going to look at, we're going to go to Isaiah from the Old Testament. And you see Isaiah, he was given really quite an amazing vision, which actually makes the Trinity more feasible, more easy for us to understand today. And by the way, even though today's emphasis, we are looking at how a Muslim will struggle with the Trinity. Well, no, no, no. This is not just for Muslims. It's for atheists. It's for you know an atheist. If they don't believe in God, they're not going to believe in the Trinity either. Um, you know, Buddhists, Shinto and so many other beliefs. So actually, even though some of you in this group, you may not actually encounter many Muslims where you are. In actual fact, well, there are many people that would not understand the Trinity. My question to you today is, do you understand the Trinity? And would you know how to explain it? And so let us look now at Isaiah chapter 63, verses 7 to 10. And I, I hope you find these verses. I mean, if you have a Bible, please do take a look. But I'm going to show you the, the verses right now. It says in verse 7, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord. That's Jehovah God. The deeds for which he is to be praised according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he's done for Israel according to his compassion and many kindnesses. In verse eight, he said, surely they are my people. Children who will be who will be true to me. And so he became their savior. That's referring to Yeshua, Jesus. Now, verse nine. In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Yet, verse 10, yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Very clear, referring to the Holy Spirit. So he turned and became the enemy, and he himself fought against them. So I think that these verses, they are they are so useful to highlight the three characteristics of God. So as you can see very clearly in verse seven, Jehovah God became the savior, Yeshua, Jesus Christ in verse eight. Um, and then it says that the people rebelled against Yeshua and grieved his Holy Spirit in verse 10. So right there, that's almost one of the very few verses in scripture that actually not many Christians, I don't, I don't hear Christians quoting that very often. Um, but, but very often these are verses which include all three characters of, of the Godhead. And without, I'm not, you know, showing full respect to, to, to Muslims. Um, but in actual fact, it seems that Muhammad only knew about the Trinity by hearsay. Um, which accounts for the statement in the Quran that Mary was part of it in Surah 5, 119, um, which, which no Christian actually believes. No Christian believes that, even though you may have Catholics that actually pray to Mary. Um, of course, as evangelical Christians, we do not do that. Um, but, you know, the nature of this subject relates, um, you know, it, really, the nature of this subject, it actually makes it imperative to treat it with reverence in the knowledge of the limitations of our mind. we got to remember, we may have an answer for some of these topics, but our mind is only can only go so far. You know, there's only so much of God we can understand. I have so much to learn about God. There's so little that I know about him. I'm so glad that he gives us eternal life because it's going to take me eternity to learn about my amazing God and Savior. And I, that's one of the beautiful things about that gift. But to believe in the triune nature of God will always be an act of faith. And so whoever you're talking to, whether it's a, a lovely Muslim person or an atheist or somebody else, you know, it's always going to take an act of faith to to increase your understanding of that characteristic of who God is. 
and you know and and this the, the perception of his oneness and so let us please look at these three personalities of God um, as described in the Bible because uh, I really want to really underpin your knowledge today of you know well you know what what do we know about the these three personalities of God and the first you know the first one we're going to look at will be God the Father what do we actually know from scripture what do we know from scripture not hearsay not all the amazing Christian teaching that's out there let's go straight to the Bible well you know the most common name for God in the New Testament is Father you know when you look at um, verses like you know Matthew 18 verse 10 See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that the angels in heaven always see their face of my father. You know, it's so beautiful. Again, look at Luke 12, 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do you see it there, father, yet again? John chapter 11, verse um, 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. It's so beautiful just to be able to lean on some of our biblical foundations to actually know, well, well, where do we get Father from instead of assuming it? And John 14, verse 12, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. Because I'm going to the Father. You know, the Bible portrays God as, um, you know, a, a God of relationships. You know, he's a father that wants to be involved in our lives. And in the Godhead, the Father, the Son and the Spirit, well, they relate to each other in perfect love. It's in a perfect love because of his nature. God invites you and me, mankind to enter into a relationship with him and to, to get to know him as father. And so so please, before we move on to looking at the son and the spirit, hold on to that, please, my brothers and sisters, that when the Bible talks about God, the father, it's all about perfect love, all about perfect relationship. And it's an it, it, it's a real illustration of that personality of God. Now, let's look at the next one, which is God, the son. You know, Jesus talked about his relationship to the heavenly father in words that emphasize his complete uniqueness as the son of God. I mean, please take a look at these these lovely verses in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. All things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son. And those to whom the son chooses to reveal to him. You know, this is such an important verse. You know, Jesus came into the world from the father and he left, left the world by returning to the father. Let's look at that. John 17 verses one to five. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those who you have given him. Now, this is eternal life. I love this description of eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ. So if I can pause and go on a tangent, when we think of eternal life, it's not about, you know, a, t a clock that never ends. No, no. Eternal life is about knowing him knowing God, the knowledge of God. And that is the, the, the challenge when we're explaining God, the Trinity to other people of other beliefs, um, faith, faiths or non-faiths. It says, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And this, this verse gives so much, you know, Je you know Jesus was not created. You know, Jesus, he pre-existed um, before his incarnation. And, you know, please take a take a look at the, the, these words. 
You know, in, in John sixteen twenty eight, I came from the Father and entered the world. So now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Micah chapter five. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Eph though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Look at John chapter one, verse one to two. <clears throat> Um, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You know, these are these are p pivotal verses for us as Christians to remember. Um, and it's important to emphasize such biblical texts when you are actually in conversation. Don't be quick just to give answers. We're, we're not here to be right. You know, um, you know, it's very important that we actually understand the foundational principles, um, you know, because they clearly demonstrate um, how, you know, how the internal and divine relationship between the father and son exists. Very, very important. And so now let's finally look at the God, the Holy Spirit. You know, again, the Holy Spirit announced by jesus well, well let's look at the words you know in john chapter 15 you know referred to here as the advocate very interesting um descriptions john 15 26 when the advocate advocate comes whom i will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who goes out from the father he will testify about me and of course by the way please can i just just ask you to pause in your thinking as we're looking at all these verses that explain about the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, I realise you're going to be talking to people that, you know, sometimes is falling on dead, deaf ears. They're not going to hear because they've already decided beforehand. Nope, I don't believe that. And whatever you tell me, I'm not going to listen to it. OK, that, that's their, their free will to, to make that decision. However, for us, we need to understand where does our understanding of the Father, Son and the Spirit come from in the Bible. And so it's also interesting to see in John 16, verse 8, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he'll prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And so you see, as we're evangelizing, we've got to remember it is the Holy Spirit that's going to be actually doing the proving the Holy Spirit is going to be backing up our words with the evidence of conviction. It's the Holy Spirit that is going to be working in the person's life, in their thinking, their rationale, um, to persuade them about their sin and regarding righteousness and judgment. What, what else do we know? In John 14, again, another verse. So important that you, 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 you take note of this verse. You know, and I would ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And, you know, for many of us as Christians, well, maybe we've learnt narratives of the gospel. I, I shared with you the, the finger gospel earlier and many other gospel presentations over the months. But but, you know, explanation is not enough. You know, um, you know, even sometimes we find it hard to, to realize, well, why do I believe in God? What did he do in my heart? You know, it's not like we were raised or born as Christians. No, we, we were born in sin. Um, for us to be a Christian, we had to make a decision which started with knowledge but it was a faith based decision and and because it's because it's believing in something we cannot see and it, it it is such a miracle that's why it is important that we move away from hearsay and opinion and stick to scripture as we're trying to explain the facts the fundamentals of the gospel john 14:26 take a look but the advocate the holy spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And, you know, that is so important to hear words like this, just, just to know that, you know, when we're evangelizing, there's going to be a lot of people not understanding. And that's why we must depend on the Holy Spirit 
as we move forward as evangelists. And in some places, the Bible mentions the three persons of the Godhead, you know, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, even in one sentence. You know, additional references, you know, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. There you go. You know, that's so important just to be able to have that in your in your in your bank of knowledge as you are sharing. Because when people say, well, where does it say it in the Bible? Well, come on. Remember Matthew 28, 19. Um, another verse for you in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, it is unquestionable to see the relationship of this, this, the three personalities in the one Godhead. And another verse and a final one. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So, yes, I know the Trinity is very complicated to explain, but please do not, not be mistaken. You know, um, we only have one God. And I think that, you know, these types of verses, they really help us in our, in our understanding. And what I want to do now is I just want to very quickly share with you something more practical for you to take away and remember. And as I share these different ways of explaining the Trinity, um, I want to just give you a word of caution. Um, please, um, we do not take these these words and we, you know, throw them in as, you know, clever ideas that might prove us right. No, you know, we must love um, our, our Muslim friends, our atheist friends, our Shinto friends, whoever they are. We've got to love them. We need to understand why do they have an objection to hearing about God and then understanding the personalities of God. How do we explain it? And these are only elements to include in your conversation, not as weapons to, to stab with, okay? We gotta use love. So I'm sure many of you will be familiar with these and let's look at them, but also let's look at the strengths and weaknesses. Let's have a little SWOT analysis on, on the pros and cons of using these illustrations. The first one I want to talk to you about today is um, is about the sun. You know, what what an amazing way to be able to. Well, sun, I love that because it's well, the sun that gives us a light is also like the sun of God who give, who's the light of the world. But what do we know about the sun? Well, the sun is a solid matter. You know, it's that that um, celestial um, um, creation there in, 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 in space, solid matter. It's a real solid thing. There's also the brightness that comes off the sun to give us light that we can see with right now. And then there's the third personality of the sun, which is the solar radiation, because if there was no sun, we would be frozen to death. So right there, you've got, you know, the sun manifests itself in solid matter, the brightness of light and through solar radiation. There's an, an illustration, only an illustration of three personalities in one entity. Um, again, I think it's got faults because if somebody is determined not to believe the Christian teaching, then I think we need to come up with more explanations. So let's look at another common one, which will be water. Again, what do we know about water? Well, we know water can be um, solid. It can exist in three states, solid, ice, um, liquid and gas. Uh, but while this is an illustration, I think it's also got limitations because the thing about water is that it cannot be all three things all at the same time. However, God, he can be God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit at the same time. So I think this is a weak ex example, but it's only an, an illustration. Um, if I can ask you to look at this, this um, new shekel, um, this coin. You know, well, a coin can be viewed from three sides. You've got the top, you've got the bottom, and you've got the edge. They are three personalities, three characteristics of one coin. And so again, you know, that might help some people, but for others it's like it's irrelevant. So you need to have more of these explanations up your sleeve. How about time? Time is now stepping into another paradigm of explanation. Because for time, you've got the past, you've got the present, and you got the future. 
And of course, one could argue that this moment right now, this very second, is all three in the same time. Because it's immediately, immediately passing, it's right now, and also it's about to happen. Um, but again, you know, when you're trying to help somebody understand God and about a relationship, there's nothing relationship in time. So let's look at humans. You know, what do we know about the human person? Well, we consist of a body, we've got a soul, and we've got a spirit. Of course, many people, have, they have many opinions, they've got of their own teachings that have other opposing philosophies. Um, but it's plain to see that we have a body. Um, but through the Bible, we can explain about the soul that God's created and about the spirit of God that gives us life. But again, you know, some of these illustrations, they can be unhelpful. Sometimes they can make more questions than give answers. So let me give you a final one and we're going to speak numerically. Um, but a final example is, you know, well, our conversation with, for example, Muslims is that God is one. Uh, and that is what a Muslim will, will, will say. And that's what Christians will say. God is one. Um, now, the, the thing about one is that, well, if you take one and you add one and then you add another one, then you unfortunately you end up with three. Um, and so I think that the illustration fails. But can I ask you to consider this other alternative? I mean, if we're talking about God, why do we give him such a small number? Why do we call him one? <laughs> I don't think God is one. I think God is infinite. And I think a Muslim will agree. God is definitely infinite. He's eternal. So let's try the mathematics. If you add infinity plus infinity and you add another infinity, what do you get? You get infinity. And I think this is maybe one of the most helpful illustrations when we're trying to explain numerically that our infinite God, um, you know, is indeed, you know, can easily be three in one. And in our teaching over the months, we've looked at some of those wrong, those um, objections, how Muslims do not believe that Jesus uh, was uh, what well, they believe is a prophet. Secondly, they do not believe he's the son of God. Um, thirdly, they do not believe that he is God. And and we've looked at all of these objections and how to answer them. And so I hope that today has maybe offered some sort of help. But remember, these types of illustrations can only in part be used, but not fully used to help people understand God or the Trinity. They are only little pointers, little tips to include in your fuller gospel presentation. It's important, though, to explain, um, you know, to the Muslim that, that Christians believe only in one God who reveals himself in three personalities. Let me just quickly pray for you, um, as I'm sure many of you have some questions you'd like to ask and we can work through that. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you very much indeed and we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've made. And I thank you so much for being such a, a mighty, magnificent God. There is so much that we have yet to learn about you. And indeed, I thank you for eternity because we're going to need it. My Lord, even for those of us that have put our faith in you and have repented and surrendered our lives to you. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we have the, pro the hope of the resurrection. And we look forward to the time, Lord, where, where you will call us home to be with you. But even uh, even there, I'm not sure we would necessarily understand everything. <laughs> How can we possibly? We cannot be like you. But I, I thank you that you are patient and you are kind and you will reveal to us so much and you will open our eyes. Now, I want to pray that you can help us with our limited understanding to to look at your word. And to understand why we believe in what we believe so that we can have a reasonable explanation to offer to people that do not even know you. Please, I pray that you'll help us to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of you. For indeed, that truly is eternal life. And please, Lord, I pray that we would all um, um, grasp a clear understanding of the gospel, that we may all have confidence in sharing it. We love you so much. We need you so much. We have so many questions. But we thank you that you've not abandoned us. I thank you that you're there all the time. 
And I just pray now this prayer in your precious and holy name, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.